The longest battle of the Second World War was fought in the cold, grey waters of the Atlantic Ocean. After victory had been achieved, Britain's wartime leader, Winston Churchill, wrote, the only thing that frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. The Royal Navy's capital ships were no insurance against the toll taken by German submarines. The U-boat's prey were the Atlantic convoys, the fragile supply lines which carried food and raw materials to the British. If they were cut, Britain's war industries would wither and her people starve. The war against the U-boats reached beyond the high seas. There was a second secret war, fought from the grounds of this Victorian country house outside London. Without the codebreakers based at Bletchley Park, the Battle of the Atlantic, and with it the war in Europe, might have been won by the U-boats. For Winston Churchill and the British people, the statistics of survival were stark. In 1939, when war broke out, Britain needed to import 55 million tons of goods by sea to support its way of life. To do this, it maintained the largest merchant fleet in the world, 3,000 ocean-going vessels and 1,000 large coastal vessels. They and their crews were in the front line from the day war broke out in September 1939. Their most dangerous enemy was the U-boat. But in 1939, the German U-boat commander, Admiral Karl Dönitz, could call on only 57 vessels, of which barely half were ocean-going. The British had faced the U-boats before. In 1917, at the height of the First World War, the U-boats had waged unrestricted war in the Atlantic. The results were dramatic. The U-boats nearly brought the British to their knees, drove the United States into the war, and hastened the introduction by the Allies of the convoy system. In February 1917, 259 ships were sunk by the U-boats, and in that month the first sea lord, Admiral Jellicoe, had warned that Britain would run out of food and other raw materials by July. The Americans needed time to mobilize. Victory seemed to be within Germany's grasp. After much bitter argument, the convoy system was given a trial in May 1917. Protected by escorts and zigzagging across the ocean, a convoy was as hard for a U-boat to find as a single ship, and considerably harder to attack. When radio intelligence gave warning of the presence of U-boats, the convoys could be diverted to avoid them. New technology was developed. Although it was never used operationally, ASDIC broke fresh ground in submarine detection. ASDIC was capable of locating submerged submarines by bouncing a sound signal off their hulls. The echo, the ping dreaded by all submariners, indicated the range and bearing of the target from the transmitting vessel, which would then attack with depth charges. If a depth charge exploded close enough to the submarine, the concussion waves it generated were sufficient to damage the target's hull and force it to surface. In 1939, the Royal Navy's continuing worldwide responsibilities ensured that it dwarfed the Kriegsmarine. Aircraft carriers, with their ability to project air power over hundreds of miles, were assuming a critical importance. Cruisers were deployed around the world, but the Navy lacked convoy escorts. In Germany, Adolf Hitler had concentrated on building a surface fleet whose heavy units could act as commerce raiders. But Hitler was swimming against the tide of naval history. His heavy units were never to be a decisive factor in the Atlantic. Hitler and his Navy's commander-in-chief, Admiral Erich Rader, had underestimated the importance of the U-boat arm and the abilities of its commander, Admiral Karl Dönitz. The Führer's interest was consumed by capital ships like the battleship Bismarck, launched at the beginning of 1939 and commissioned in August 1940. But Admiral Dönitz was a formidable champion of the U-boat service against his superiors. <laughs> 
Karl Dönitz had joined the submarine service in 1916 and had been captured by the British in October 1918. Between the wars, he had played a major role in keeping submarine expertise alive and took command of the U-boat service in 1935. Dönitz was a fervent Nazi who had the ear of Adolf Hitler. But Dönitz was not to achieve his anticipated target of 300 U-boats until July 1942. Moreover, at the beginning of the war, Dönitz's U-boats were under instructions not to sink unarmed merchantmen without warning. This did not prevent a fateful incident on the evening of the 3rd of September 1939, the day Britain went to war with Germany. One of Dönitz's U-boats, U-30, accidentally sank without warning the British liner Athenia off the coast of Scotland. The U-boat's captain had mistaken Athenia for an armed merchantman. The sinking of Athenia prompted the British Admiralty to make an important strategic decision. Convinced that the Germans had decided on a policy of unrestricted submarine warfare, which in fact was not implemented until August 1940, the Admiralty immediately introduced ocean-going convoys for ships with speeds between 9 and 15 knots. Slower vessels had to take their chance alone, until the introduction, a year later, of slow convoys. Shortly afterwards, the Royal Navy took delivery of 50 elderly American destroyers for use as convoy escorts. The British paid for them by granting the United States 99-year leases on a number of air bases in the Caribbean. In the first phase of the Battle of the Atlantic, the majority of victims claimed by the U-boats were ships sailing alone. The U-boats also scored significant successes against British warships, sinking the battleship Royal Oak at Scarpa Flow and the aircraft carrier Courageous while she was on anti-submarine patrol. But attacking convoys from bases in Germany proved more hazardous. The situation changed dramatically after the fall of France in June 1940. One of the most significant spoils of the campaign was access to the French Atlantic ports and a springboard for U-boat operations in the Atlantic. Hitler ordered the construction of bomb-proof U-boat pens in bases on France's northwest coast. The command centre was at Lorient, in Brittany. Dönitz's U-boat fleet now began to operate in the eastern Atlantic, concentrating on the Cape route to South Africa and occasionally making sorties into the Mediterranean. In the spring of 1941, as they refined their anti-convoy tactics, the U-boats steadily expanded their operations into the central and western Atlantic. The limited Allied air cover for the convoys left a tempting mid-Atlantic gap, which the U-boats were able to exploit. The U-boat commanders called the period from July to October 1940 the happy time. Happy for some. In these months, they sank 217 ships for the loss of only two U-boats. Most of their victims were still sailing on their own. U-boat commander Gunter Prien was one of several submarine aces who became propaganda heroes. Dönitz's commanders and crews enjoyed rich pickings during the happy time. The medals they won reflected their success. The Royal Navy, facing the threat of a cross-channel invasion of southern England, could spare few ships to harry the U-boats. On the 17th of August, 1940, Hitler declared a total blockade of the British Isles. He directed that shipping of whatever nationality 
with the exception of a handful of specified Irish ships, was to be sunk on site. For the British, the crisis was compounded by the accelerating rate of U-boat production. And the introduction of wolf pack tactics. Dernitz was keenly aware of the mathematical disadvantage under which the U-boats laboured. Because the speed of a submerged submarine was often lower than that of a merchant ship, a lone U-boat captain wrongly positioned to attack a convoy would have a long wait before another came along. Even then, he would have no guarantee that he would be correctly positioned to deal with the new target. Dernitz's answer was a pack of submarines deployed in a chain on the surface. The wolf pack could identify the approach of a convoy across a wide band of ocean and concentrate against a target by radio command from the shore. In a wolf pack battle, the convoy escorts would be overwhelmed by weight of numbers, leaving the convoy defenseless. At this stage in the war, escorts were in short supply. On average, three destroyers and a corvette to every 40 merchantmen on a 3,000-mile voyage across the Atlantic. ASDIC, the echo-sounding equipment used to detect a submerged U-boat, was useless beyond a 1,000 yards and gave only range and bearing, not depth. Depth readings would not be achieved until 1944. The depth charges used to attack the U-boats, triggered by water pressure fuses, had to be set by guesswork. If they didn't detonate close to the U-boat's hull, the submariners would live to fight another day. In a close encounter, the U-boats tracked their hunters with the aid of hydrophones. Most U-boat attacks were launched at night. A radar would have been a useful weapon to use against them, but it was still too primitive an instrument to be effective against U-boats swarming in under the cover of darkness. Even communication between the escorts and the escorted was inadequate, conducted as it was by signal lamps, sirens and flags. It was not until the end of 1940 that escorts were fitted with radio telephones. The U-boat menace was growing. And for the moment at least, Dernit seemed to hold most of the cards. But even during Britain's darkest hour, in July 1940, with invasion looming, the Royal Navy was beginning to fight back. At Tobermory, on the Scottish island of Mull, headquarters of the training base HMS Western Isles, escort commanders learned their trade under the watchful eye of the hard-driving Commodore Gilbert O. Stevenson. Stevenson, who was dubbed the terror of Tobermory, instilled a new discipline into his trainees which was to save many cargoes and many lives. Anti-submarine technology was also improving. In April 1942, the new centimetric radar was able to pick up a surfaced submarine at a range of 10 miles and a periscope at distances of about 1,300 yards. The next problem was how to design a system which could be carried in an aircraft. The technological seesaw swung to and fro. On the other side of the hill, wireless intercepts and decrypts of Royal Navy's cipher transmissions were being used by the German Baydienst listening service 
to establish the position of convoys and to read their orders. The Beydienst was now reading up to 2,000 British signals a week. But German intelligence had a potentially fatal weakness in its own armor. Each U-boat carried an Enigma encoding machine. British codebreakers at Bletchley Park were reading the encoded Enigma messages transmitted back to Lorient in Morse code and also intercepted by the British Y listening service. The Germans believed that Enigma was unbreakable and the Kriegsmarine's rigorous encoding procedures made it an extremely tough nut to crack. The Enigma machine resembled a typewriter, but one in which the letter whose key the operator struck could be substituted by another in the remarkable number of 150 million, million, million ways. Given the almost infinite number of settings available to the Enigma's operator, and the frequency with which they were changed, the Germans were convinced that the system was secure. It was not until June 1941 that Bletchley Park broke into the naval enigma. On the 9th of May 1941, U-110, commanded by the submarine ace Julius Lemp, was forced to surface while attacking convoy OB-318. Escort leader Captain Joe Baker Cresswell in the destroyer Bulldog, decided to ram the U-boat. Then, to the surprise of his subordinates, he ordered the U-boat to be boarded. The German submariners who had abandoned ship were taken on board Bulldog. But Lemp, realizing what the British had in mind, began to swim back to his U-boat. He was discouraged by Lewis gun fire and was never seen again. U-110 was boarded and a treasure trove of code books and minefield charts was recovered. But most important of all was an Enigma machine and a list of settings. It was one of the most important naval intelligence breakthroughs in the war. Bulldog took U-110 under tow, but the submarine quickly found it. To the end of the war, the Germans assumed that the U-boat had taken her secrets to the bottom. From the moment of Baker Cresswell's brilliant stroke of initiative, until February 1942, Bletchley Park could read high-grade German naval signals traffic without delay and pass it to the Admiralty's tracking room. Then the introduction of a fourth rotor to the Enigma machine put the British codebreakers back to square one. But in November 1942, HMS Petard captured one of the new rotors from U-559 in the Mediterranean. Once more, the flow of signals could be deciphered. The decryption of the Enigma signals made it possible to reroute convoys away from concentrations of U-boats. It has been estimated that in the months following the U-110 incident, this measure saved about 350 ships carrying 1.5 million tons of cargo. It also gave the British a breathing space in which they could bring more anti-submarine weapons to bear. High-frequency direction finding, or huff-duff, enabled escorts to detect and locate U-boats shadowing their convoys from the transmissions they made to U-boat headquarters. Convoys could then be rerouted, or, if they were available, aircraft summoned. The U-boats remained a deadly menace, particularly in the areas where air escort was unavailable to the convoys. The U-boats often worked in tandem with the long-range Fokker Wolf 200 Condor reconnaissance bomber. The Condors acted as a spotter for the Wolfbacks and also attacked shipping themselves. Sometimes it was the U-boats which called up the Condors to attack convoys with their cannon and 4,000-pound bomb load. When they hit convoy HG-53 in February 1941, the Condors sank five ships. 
One way of providing the convoys with air cover was to use catapult-armed merchantmen, the so-called CAM ships. These ships carried a Hawker Hurricane fighter, which could be launched from the deck by a catapult. After the mission, the pilot had either to ditch his aircraft in the sea close to the camp ship or to parachute from it. Escort carriers were also introduced. The first to go into service in June 1941 was Audacity, ironically converted from the hull of a German liner. Later in the war, escort carriers mass-produced in the United States were to be the hub of self-contained strike forces dedicated not merely to protecting convoys but to taking the fight to the U-boats. Audacity herself proved so successful that Dernitz offered a prize for her destruction. The end of December 1941 saw a furious running battle between convoy HG-76 and a large wolf pack. Both sides took heavy casualties. One of the victims was U-567, commanded by Dernitz's top-scoring ace, Engelbert Endras. Another was a carrier Audacity, sunk by four torpedoes fired by U-751. The battle continued until the convoy came within range of air cover. The United States had entered the war in December 1941, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But even before this, the US Navy had been involved in the Battle of the Atlantic. From September 1941, although still technically non-belligerents, the Americans had been escorting convoys from a point 400 miles west of Iceland. Now that the Americans were combatants, however, the U-boats enjoyed a second happy time as they plundered unescorted shipping off the eastern seaboard of the United States. From January 1942, up to a dozen U-boats were cruising in these waters and in the Gulf of Mexico at any one time. They were to enjoy rich pickings, moving south in February where the bright lights of Miami still blazed for tourists. The U-boats' range and endurance were extended by the so-called Milchkau submarines, which could carry 450 tons of fuel as well as the 206 tons they needed for themselves. First in service was U-459, fueling U-boats north of Bermuda. By August 1942, five were operational. Milch cows were protected against air attack by two 37mm and one 20mm gun. But in the end, all but one of the milch cows were sunk wholly or in part by anti-submarine aircraft. In the first three months of 1942, the U-boats sank 1.3 million tons of shipping, a kill rate four times higher than that achieved in the Atlantic in 1941. It was not until May 1942 that the convoy system was introduced, and the U-boats' plunder of ships, large and small, brought the second happy time to an end. The US Navy also introduced a new approach to air cover in the form of semi-rigid airships. The blimps proved remarkably efficient weapons in the war against the U-boats. By now, the U-boats had acquired a formidable enemy, the shipyards of America. Two developments were of crucial importance, the introduction of a standardized tanker, the T-10, and a freighter, the Liberty ship. Both of them were large and fast compared with their pre-war equivalents, and thanks to prefabrication, quick to build. By the autumn of 1942, American yards were launching three Liberty ships a day. In November, the Robert E. Peary was built from the keel up in four days. In Britain, the appointment of a submarine specialist, Admiral Sir Max Horton, as Commander-in-Chief Western Approaches, brought a new vigour to the war against the U-boats. <laughs> 
Horton now had the armory with which to take the war to the U-boats. By the middle of 1942, the Battle of the Atlantic was still evenly poised. The U-boats knew Shark Key had once more drawn a veil over their Enigma traffic. The US Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy, which was undergoing a wartime expansion from six to 400 ships, were still learning the basics of convoy protection. In Britain, the RAF's coastal command was engaged in a bitter battle with Bomber Command over the allocation of long-range aircraft. Was it more productive to bomb German cities or sink U-boats at sea? It was a battle which, for the moment, Bomber Command was winning. And now, for the first time, Dönitz had the 300 U-boats which he needed to sever Britain's Atlantic lifeline. In November 1942, U-boat sinkings in the North Atlantic reached a total of 509,000 tons. Foul weather reduced the U-boat rampage by half in December and January 1943, but thereafter the sinkings began to increase. In February, in spite of continuing heavy seas, 120 U-boats sank nearly 300,000 tons of shipping in the North Atlantic. In March, the U-boats sent 108 ships to the bottom, the majority of them lost in convoy. The U-boats seemed to have victory in their sights at a time when the U.S. Army was accelerating the build-up of men and material in Britain. There were echoes of 1918 here, in the race between the U-boats and the gathering American military might. Against all the odds, it appeared as if the U-boats might win. Dönitz now decided to exploit the air gap which still existed in the Allied anti-submarine defences south of Greenland. It would soon become known as Torpedo Junction. His U-boats had a new weapon, a clockwork torpedo. When fired at long range, it would weave among the lines of ships with a good chance of hitting one. In March, a furious battle was fought by two convoys eastbound from America, in which 40 U-boats sank 22 out of 90 merchantmen and one of their 20 escorts. Churchill and his war cabinet were casting anxious eyes at the graphs and statistics which recorded the ebb and flow of the Battle of the Atlantic. But in this relentless war of numbers, it was Dönitz who was about to receive a nasty shock, for the Allied losses reflected only part of the picture. The Allies had now built enough shipping to replace the losses incurred since 1939, and with superior ships. In contrast, U-boat losses were beginning to equal launchings at a monthly rate of 15. The tide was swinging in the Allies' favour. In the intelligence war, the codebreakers of Bletchley Park had clawed their way back. Once again, they were reading the U-boat's Enigma traffic enabling convoys to be rerouted to safety. And the convoy escorts were being provided with powerful new anti-submarine weapons. Hedgehog was a mortar used in conjunction with ASDIC and fired ahead of the escort to fall in an overall pattern around the target U-boat. The system had the advantage of not interrupting the ASDIC contact unless there was a hit which was likely to force the U-boat to the surface. Support groups led by escort carriers now began to seek out and destroy the harrying U-boats. 
convoys now became the bait to lure the wolf packs into head-on clashes with the support groups. This time, however, it was to be the U-boats which were overwhelmed by weight of numbers. Even the flimsy-looking fairy swordfish packed a punch. Allied technology provided the key. Centimetric radar, with its greater power and resistance to jamming, could now be fitted to anti-submarine aircraft like the short Sunderland, dubbed the flying porcupine by the Germans. The mid-Atlantic gap, in which the U-boats had wrought such havoc, was to be closed by the Americans' very long-range Liberator, which flew from bases in Northern Ireland, Iceland and Newfoundland. These aircraft were to be the nemesis of surfaced U-boats. Soon there would be no place for the U-boats to hide from the pitiless eyes in the sky. The cavity magnetron was the key to centimetric radar. In March 1943, a magnetron valve fell into German hands. But astonishingly, the Germans refused to credit the British with the ability to develop such a high-frequency air-to-surface radar. In fact, British work on the radar was nearing completion. By the spring of 1943, the radars were installed and the crews trained in their use. U-boat losses began to rise. The wolf packs were now caught in a tightening technological vice from which there was no escape. The air power wrested back from the bomber offensive by Coastal Command was taking its toll. In May, U-boat losses reached 43, more than double the replacements waiting in Germany. Night could no longer provide cover for the wolf packs. Once the radar had done its work, the aircraft closed with its prey, which it illuminated with a powerful searchlight mounted in its belly. The Lee light, which had been introduced in the summer of 1942, was another potent addition to the submarine hunter's armory. By the end of the war, 218 U-boats had been attacked by night, 27 sunk and 31 severely damaged. Escort carrier aircraft were now armed with the Mark 24 mine. The Mark 24 was in fact a torpedo, which homed on the noise of a U-boat's propeller. Its first success came in April 1943. One aircraft from the carrier USS Santi forced a U-boat to dive, while a second planted the homing torpedo in the disturbed water. The air threat was now throttling U-boat operations. At first, Dönitz ordered his U-boat commanders to fight it out in the Bay of Biscay, but mounting losses forced them to make their passage to the North Atlantic submerged. By May 1943, there were no longer any air gaps in the mid-Atlantic for the wolf packs to exploit. Their patrols were scattered. When they concentrated, Allied aircraft were waiting for them. Not only were the Germans unable to detect or jam centimetric radar, they also persisted in the belief that the growing crisis was caused by a combination of signal insecurity or a wholly imaginary infrared detection device. The Germans were interested in such a device, but the British were not. During May 1943, Dönitz lost 43 U-boats, 
a rate which ran far ahead of the German shipyard's ability to replace them. At the beginning of May, no fewer than 42 U-boats had attacked convoy ONS-5. They sank a dozen merchantmen, but lost six of their own submarines and suffered heavy damage to another 12. On the 24th of May, Dönitz bowed to the inevitable and withdrew his wolf packs to lick their wounds. Dönitz later wrote that it was at this moment that he knew the Battle of the Atlantic was lost. But this did not mark the end of the U-boat war. Urgent research was undertaken on new designs with more powerful electric motors which would boost underwater speeds from the usual 7 to 18 knots. Meanwhile, the Germans fought to staunch the majority of losses which occurred on the surface. The answer was the schnorkel, a breathing tube which could be raised like a mast above sea level to allow prolonged diving under diesel instead of electric power. The schnorkel's disadvantage was that, like a periscope, it left both a telltale plume of spray and a radar signature. One allied counter was squid, a three-barrel mortar system linked to an advanced sonar which gave the precise depth of the target, enabling the depth charges to be accurately fused to detonate at the same depth as their quarry. In September 1943, the wolf packs returned to their hunting grounds in the North Atlantic, planning to wreak havoc on Allied convoys with their new acoustic torpedoes. But by early 1944, the wolf packs had been broken up, and the U-boats reduced to operating as lone hunters. In June 1944, as the Allies established a bridgehead in Normandy, the U-boats were committed to an attack on the invasion forces. But as the British and Americans moved inland, the U-boat sank only six ships while losing 11 of their own. As the Allies overran France, Dönitz lost his U-boat bases covering the Bay of Biscay. By the closing stages of the war, the Germans had completed a number of advanced U-boat designs, the most promising of which was the Type 21. This had advanced engines and a large battery capacity which made it faster submerged than on the surface. But although 120 were commissioned, only one Type 21 saw action in the last week of the war. The German surrender gave the men of the Royal Navy the chance to examine their adversaries at close quarters. They were the survivors of the costliest campaign of the Second World War. Of the 830 U-boats dispatched by the Kriegsmarine, 696 had been lost, almost all of them in the Atlantic. The overall casualty rate among crews had been 75%, greater than that suffered by any other service of any combatant in the war. The U-boats had claimed nearly 2,500 merchant ships but had lost the Battle of the Atlantic. These figures dwarfed those of the submarine war in the Mediterranean, but here too there was a life and death struggle for supremacy. German and Italian submarines concentrated on cutting Allied supply lines to the island fortress of Malta, with some notable successes. In November 1941, U-81 torpedoed and sank the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. Within a week, another U-boat had claimed the battleship Bar. But the Allies scored a more critical success in starving the Africa Corps of the supplies needed to sustain its campaign in the Western Desert. <laughs> 
the commander of the Africa Corps, Erwin Rommel, was utterly dependent on the Axis convoys sailing from Italy. But they suffered crippling losses at the hands of British submarines and aircraft. The Mediterranean supply war was won with the help of the codebreakers at Bletchley Park. Once again, it was the cracking of an Enigma code which helped to turn the tide. This time, it was the Luftwaffe Enigma traffic, notorious for its careless encoding, which came to the aid of the Allies. The Luftwaffe's escort duties gave the Allies advance warning of the convoy sailings and routes. Submarines and aircraft were then vectored onto convoys. As was standard practice with Enigma, a cover story was invariably devised to disguise the source of this vital information. As a result of the Enigma intercepts, Allied submarines and aircraft were able to deprive Rommel of about half the supplies destined for North Africa. Axis warships and aircraft battled to keep the convoy routes open, but these losses were to prove critical when the desert war reached a climax at the Battle of El Alamein in November 1942. Allied submarines had played a major role in turning the tide in North Africa. In the vast expanses of the Pacific, submarines were to play an equally decisive role. Japan had no natural resources of its own, and depended utterly on a huge merchant fleet for food and raw materials. It was to secure these resources that Japan went to war with the United States by attacking the Pacific Fleet at its base at Pearl Harbor. Within six months of launching the attack on the 7th of December 1941, the Japanese had carved out a huge empire in the Far East and Pacific. At the beginning of the war, both navies had larger submarine fleets than the Kriegsmarine. And their boats were also far larger, designed to cruise the expanses of the Pacific Ocean. But the Japanese plans for their use differed radically from those of their main opponent or the Kriegsmarine. Their naval high command envisaged its submarine forces as an adjunct to the surface fleet, engaging the enemy's battleships and aircraft carriers in major actions. Because great swathes of the Pacific and the greater part of its merchant traffic now lay inside their defensive perimeter, the Japanese did not plan to use their submarines as commerce raiders, as Dernitz had done to such devastating effect in the Atlantic. This proved a fundamental error, as attacks on heavily escorted warships resulted in heavy losses for little return. Attacks on Allied troop transport convoys would have yielded greater benefits at far lower cost. After 1943, however, the principal role of the Japanese submarine arm was to run supplies to isolated garrisons across the Pacific. In contrast, from the moment the United States declared war on Japan, the US Navy initiated a policy of all-out war on the merchant shipping which underpinned the Japanese Empire. At first, however, the American submarines struggled to make an impact. They had to work blind, without the benefit of radar. And their torpedoes had a serious design fault, which meant that as many as one in three failed to function properly. These were difficult days for the American submarine arm. Its vessels undertook long voyages, carrying enough food for 60 days. Their 80-man crews endured grueling conditions. Like the British, the Americans enjoyed a priceless advantage. On Hawaii was the American naval equivalent of Bletchley Park, Station Hypo. 
It was at Hypo that American cryptographers had cracked the Japanese naval code JN-25. This success had secured victory at Midway in June 1942, the turning point in the Pacific War. JN-25 was not the only enemy code read by the Americans and British. They had both gained access to the merchant shipping Maru codes. The records at Bletchley Park preserve details of the enemy convoy's cargoes, destinations and ultimate fate. In the Atlantic, access to enemy codes had enabled the vital rerouting of convoys away from the waiting wolf packs. In the Pacific, it enabled American intelligence to direct submarines towards their quarry. And in such a huge theater of war, this information, coupled with the introduction to submarines of radar, was decisive. The Japanese convoys often sailed in small groups, escorted by a handful of elderly destroyers. They were cold meat for American submarines guided to their targets by the codebreakers and their onboard radar. In the first six months of 1944, submarine and aircraft attacks slashed Japan's oil supply by 75%. Throughout the course of the war in the Pacific, American submarines sank nearly 5 million tons of shipping. At home, Japanese war production was halved. So successful were the American submarines at throttling Japan's lines of supply that long before the end of the war, the US Navy's submarine building program was dramatically cut back. By the end of 1944, the remnants of the Japanese merchant fleet were hugging the coastline, seeking waters too shallow for the submarines to press home their attacks. The submarines were running out of targets and the Japanese were running out of food. With the oil tap turned off, motor transport and heating fuel vanished. Japanese industry ground to a halt. At the end of the war, the submarine's quarry included German U-boats running the Pacific gauntlet to Japan. Enigma intercepts identified many of their cargoes. These included dismantled jet aircraft, material for the Japanese atomic bomb project, and ironically, a large consignment of Enigma machines. When the war came to an end in August 1945, there were still some 5 million Japanese fighting men and 11,000 aircraft in the field. But they could not move without the food and fuel denied them by American submarines. In addition to destroying 1,178 Japanese merchant ships, American submarines had sunk 214 Japanese warships and served as supply ships and as transports to put commando forces ashore. They had also laid mines and rescued downed pilots. But their major wartime achievement had been to cut Japan's supplies of raw materials. For the loss of 49 submarines, theirs had been a vital part in Allied victory. In the warm waters of the Pacific, the American submariners had achieved what Dönitz U-boats had come so agonizingly close to securing in the grey waters of the Atlantic. Here, it had been a close-run thing. Okay.